Without further ado, I want to welcome everybody once again uh, to our tasting series with Blair Guthrie, winemaking extraordinaire. Tonight we are talking about the beautiful 2017 Hollis Wines Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, this is the first cab that we will have done in this series um, and couldn't think of a more A, delicious, um, B, kind of like ap approachable and accessible uh, wine from a price point perspective. Uh, as always, we'll be taking your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom here. Looks like you guys are, are just starting to fill up the Q&A. So please, please, please um, continue to fill up the Q&A with questions for Blair, questions for myself, questions about cab, Napa, wine in general, yeah. uh, life, philosophy, happiness, whatever you feel like peppering Blair with tonight. Um, you know, there are no limits. Yeah. So a little bit different of a conversation. I mean, we're really in a different world now. We're yeah. in a Napa Valley making cab here versus that glue glue from, you know, Mindo or Sonoma or whatever it is. So with that in mind, let's, uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, Blair, talk to us a little bit about where Hollis fits into the repertoire and kind of the vertical of brands that you right. uh, make the wine for uh, and how did it come about? Yeah, so, so Hollis is part of the, the Stewart portfolio. So we've been tasting Guthrie Family Wines, which is my personal brand. Um, the Stewart portfolio is, is um, my wife, myself, and my brother-in-law, James. Um, so Hollis is, our, is kind of our mid-tier cab. So we have, this, we have Slingshot, and we have Hollis, and then we have Stewart. So Hollis is in the middle for us. And so it's really um, a super price-friendly kind of luxury Napa cab. Um, Hollis originally started, so that Hollis was the family's dog, Hollis. Um, that's where the name's from. Hollis originally started back in the 2000s um, because when they were blending, before I was a winemaker, when they were blending the Stuart Sellers Cabernet, which is a $75 cab, whatever didn't make the cut that would go into that high-end premium Cabernet, they, they needed to do something with those, those barrels of the rest of that wine. And so they created Hollis and they put it into Hollis and then they sold it for 50% less than, than, than the Stuart Cab. Um, that never really meant that it's, it doesn't mean that it's a second class wine or it's, it's bad or anything. It, it just means that the, the caliber that was going into Stuart is so, so much higher. Um, but, you know, these days, Stuart really, that's how it started. And it was always just a couple of hundred cases. Um, but it really got like a bit of a cult following behind it. Because once people realized that, well, this is actually really good, like, and it's really affordable. And then they find out, well, actually, this is the same fruit that's going into the, the premium Stuart cab. Um, they kind of caught on and it got like this little bit of cult following going on around the US. Um, and now we do, uh, you know, this year, I'm going to bottle 2000 cases of it. Um, and I actually harvest fruit specifically for it now. So not only am I also, is it getting um, some of the barrels that don't make it into the Stuart cab, but I'm also harvesting specific fruit that is, is built for this program. Um, so, you know, being a winemaker is not just about making wine. You've got to think about the business side of things as well. And so this, with this wine, um, you know, when I'm making, so I make $175 big, Cabernet for Stuart Sellers. Price of anything never comes into the equation. When we have to make a wine like Stuart, I really have to think about where I'm going to spend my money on it. If I have to spend too much money, we, we won't make any margin on it, and then it's not worth doing the product. So I have to be very selective about the fruit that I'm buying for it and that I'm using in it. I have to be very selective about the barrels that I use in it. Um, we're really lucky that I'm farming a vineyard in Napa that we use, and we farm, so we farm the, that vineyard we lease and farm it, and it means our cost is lower. We're able to get that fruit to ourselves for less, and I can use that fruit in, in this blend. Um, so like, those are all things that you've got to take into account when you're trying to make you know, a, a sub $50 cab in Napa, which is hard to do. Um, the reality of Napa Valley Cabernet is I think the average is $70 a bottle now. Maybe it's 68, um, but it's pretty high. So, you know, we're, we're, we're well below the average price. Um, but I think quality wise, it really delivers, you know? Yeah. I, and I want to go back to the point you made kind of about the ability to declassify grapes and, and, and wines, because yeah. you're right. I think the initial thought for somebody when they hear that is saying, Oh, well, this isn't 
up to snuff for this other wine, then what makes it such, you know, what then, then why is it worth paying attention to? And I think that my initial thought would be twofold, I guess. Number one, as you noted, that really does speak to the quality uh, and the kind of gravitas of the wines that are going into the Grand Cuvée yeah. uh, and, and stuff like that. And then second of all, you know, just because just because a, a wine is declassified, uh, you can declassify wines for hundreds of different reasons. You know, in, in the old world, we see it because maybe the vines are younger or, you know, maybe these barrel, maybe these wines in certain barrels in certain parts of the winery were showing better in their youth. And so they might want to bottle them young. Yeah, no. Totally. So can you go into the decision for what are you looking at when all when you're in the barrel room, you're tasting through barrels, you're seeing the grapes come in. What are some of the things that you're looking at for maybe the decisions that go into dividing out uh, and and kind of uh, assigning resources? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a big one would be um, is the barrels. You know, when I'm putting the Stuart Cab blend together, and I go through and I know I picked my lots that I know are the best lots. But then I go through and individually taste every single barrel. And some barrels show better than other barrels. And it could be for a multitude of reasons. Maybe it's an older barrel. Maybe the toast level on the new oak wasn't really working that harvest for that fruit. Um, so I might go through and taste a barrel and be like, oh, this is an awesome barrel, but it doesn't, it doesn't have the right tannin structure that I need for the Stuart Sellers blend but it has the perfect tannin structure that I need for Hollis. Um, so that, that would be the biggest part of it when, I, when I'm declass, declassifying for this blend is like, it's not necessarily that the wine itself is better or worse, it's that it doesn't fit together with this jigsaw that I'm building over here. It needs to go into this jigsaw. Um, that would be the biggest thing because when I bring the fruit in, for everything in the winery, I treat everything with the intention of it to making the top tier wine always. I never go into it going, oh, these grapes are going to be for X blend. I'm just going to like do whatever to them and not give them, give them time and effort. I treat every fermentation as if it's going to go into our $75 Cabernet. That way I, I get good solid wine at the end of the day. I think that's a big part of the reason why Hollis over delivers so well is that it's been treated like it should be a $70 cab that you're getting for a sub 50, you know, what is it like, what was it on your side? I think it's sub 40 on your side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a bargain. It, I mean, Absolutely. That, when you, when you add, so on the business side of winemaking, when you add a cost in it to be able to make Napa cab at that price, like I say this to James and Caroline all the time, like, like, wow, the fact that we can do that and make money on that skew is really, it's really good. Um, you know, now that it's starting to grow a, a lot more and I'm, intentionally buying fruit for it and you know, I'm starting to really dive into a, its own barrel program as well. And so, you know, the reality is, is that some barrels I use on our premium stuff, they cost me $1,200 per barrel. Um, and and that, that's not really, I can't, I can't really do that for Hollis. You know, I can use a couple of those barrels, but if I use my, spent that on my whole barrel program, it would just blow my cost out of water. So, you know, I look at, finding some other cooperages that are a little less expensive um, that are maybe $800 or $900 a barrel. Just it shaves a couple of hundred bucks off per barrel. Um, yeah. And then I'll use a little less oak in this blend as well. So usually in Hollis, um, it's like 40 to 50% New York versus in the Stuart cab, I'm usually up around that 60, 65% New York. Yeah. Um, Jim Washburn tugged in on the Q&A, uh, which I, again, we want to encourage all of you to submit questions via the Q&A. And he was asking for clarification on what we mean by declassified. And, uh, you know, that maybe it isn't the right word, uh, but what we mean is just when you have a lot of grapes, uh, like a literal lot, not like, oh, I have a ton of grapes, right. but like a literal, a literal, uh, when you have like a, a collection of grapes uh, coming into the winery, uh, and you're putting them in barrel and, and you're going through the process of, of deciding what wines are going into what bottlings, essentially, uh, and what barrels you're blending together to create your final um, wine. What we mean by declassifying is having the ability to kind of sort that fruit and sort the wines themselves and not just have to sell it as bulk juice, of having a label that you can still celebrate that quality fruit in and celebrate it well, 
while also creating a distinction between your you know your top Stewart Napa Valley Cabernets that are seventy dollars a bottle and something that you're able to get into the marketplace for a price like this one. Right. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, is I have hundreds and hundreds of barrels full of wine. And so I've got to go in and through and sort all these into these little channels on where they're going to live and where they're going to stay. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, I, declassifying, I guess it's like a bad choice of words, but I mean, that's what we use. It's what we use in the winery, I guess. Um, it's, it's really not. It's really like a lot of the time, some barrels, they could be an amazing barrel. It just doesn't fit into the blend. It doesn't work. You know, maybe sometimes it can be too, it can be too fruity. Sometimes it can be too tannic. Sometimes not enough tannin. You know, if I'm building the Stuart blend and it's just really, really tannic, I'm, I'm going to like, okay, I have to like keep some of these nice big tannic barrels out and kick them over to Hollis. And I need to take some of those soft fruity barrels that I was keeping for Hollis and actually put them over into the Stuart stuff. So it goes the other way as well. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, a couple of really, really good questions here. I'm going to get to a recent one first. Uh, just because it fits in with what we're talking about. So, uh, G Go Timer, uh, I'm probably butchering this in terms of what you meant your screen name to be, but uh, how do you make decisions about your customers' palettes between your palettes, critics' palettes, your father in law's palettes when yeah. you're making these big cabs? Because, and you and I, I know you and I have talked about this before, you the reality is, is when you're making Napa Valley Cabernet you have to take into consideration the business side of it. And part of the business side of it is the marketing and the marketing that comes from critic scores. While you don't want to make any exceptions about a wine that lives up to your standards, you know, basically how do you find that balance? I think yeah, is, I mean, is really what the question it's is. Pretty, it's pretty tricky. So I definitely think about who's going to be drinking the wines and there's different people who are going to be drinking Hollis versus our $175 Nomad cab that we do from Big Stop. It's just, it's a different crowd. Um, I, 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 the, the critics come into my head, but I, I don't try to listen to that too much. I really feel like if you're trying to please all of these people, you spend your whole career chasing your tail. You know, you, if you're trying to please Robert Parker, the critic Robert Parker, and then you're, you chase him and then you're please Antonio Galoni and then you end up doing, he likes something different and then trying to keep, you know, the customer base happy. They like this over here. You just, you just go around in a circle. So yeah. I, I take it into consideration when I'm blending, but at the end of the day, I do what I think is right. And what I think is an awesome wine that I would enjoy drinking. Um, I feel like I'm a really, a pretty open-minded person and I, and I, I listen to everybody's opinions and, and I keep them in the back of my head, you know, I know that I'm not the only one drinking this wine. So I try to think about, you know, what would my customer like? And, you know, that comes with experience and listening to customer feedback. And, and the reality is when you distribute your wine around the country, the market tells you pretty quickly if they like it or not. Um, so, you know, when a, if a wine's not selling and the distributors are saying, no, it was just a really tough sell because of such and such, you know, I take that into consideration. Or when we do sell a lot of wine, I, I'm like, great, that's good feedback. I know what's working and what I'm doing. Um, you know, so, you know, I take it into consideration, but at the end of the day, I do what I think is right. That's why I'm the winemaker, right? And someone needs to be leading, leading the charge on, on how yeah. to do that. I was gonna say how, I was gonna ask like, how stubborn do you allow yourself to be? Like, even if the market is saying like, okay, well, it'd be easier to sell if, if this one thing were different and you're like, no, screw that. Like, this is yeah, I mean, the thing is, is making a hundred point wine, man. I mean, I know that I could like, like just blow out one of my big cabs and make it super plush and super velvety and voluptuous and have a couple of grams of sugar in it to make it sweet. And, and the critics will be all over it, but I don't know. I feel like I don't want to lose my integrity as a winemaker and and, and a big part of what I do is I want my wines to age and those wines fall to pieces and, and as soon as you open them. So I want these wines to be around in 10 years and when someone opens them, them go, oh, wow, this is good. Not like, oh, this fell over pretty quick. What was that guy up to? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's so funny. You try like old Camus like mm -hmm. with, with the old label too. <laughs> like the, I think maybe it's the label, but like old Camus before it was... You know, 12 gra 12 grams a liter yeah. of sugar in it yeah. those wines live forever 
and they were good. They were delicious. They were fresh and they had power for sure, but they were super fresh and lively. Uh, and you know, special selection tastes like maple syrup to me. To me, I mean, I I know a lot of people love those wines, and I don't mean that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I I personally, and I'm got no problems with it. I think Caymus is horrible. <laughs> um, I mean, I just it, it's a it's not a healthy drink to be consuming. Um, but there, he, you know, he Joe Wagner, so he's the son, and he got caught on camera saying, um, "I know the American palate, and American and Americans love soda and pop tarts or whatever it was." What's that? Is it a yeah pop tarts? Pop tarts, yeah. And, and so, like that's like what he was. He's basically he was decided that they're going to put Coca Cola into a wine bottle, you know. Oh. And I, I just uh, I, they don't give people enough credit. No. Um, I think that people right, actually people have are actually they know what they like, you know. And I think that yeah. people don't like in the wine industry. People don't give people like the customer enough credit. Like they they can get into wine and they can understand it. You just gotta. Yeah. I think the reason that people don't is that they're scared, because the wine industry has been really good at making people feel like they don't know anything. Really good. Um, back to the wine itself. Uh, Question from Patrick Osak, uh, and this goes back to what we actually talked about on Tuesday. Uh, you said on Tuesday that to call a wine a cab, it needs to have 75% cab grapes. Uh, what percentage are the grapes in this wine actually Cabernet Sauvignon, and what else is in this, if anything, so delicious? Uh, great, great question. So this has 86% Cabernet Sauvignon in it, um, and then it has 14% Merlot in it. Um, so part of the, the reason I did the Merlot is that this wine was actually looking too big. It was too tannic. Um, Merlot is a really fine grained, um, got really fine grained tannin. It's kind of like, ele it's the elegant cousin to, to Cabernet Sauvignon really. And so the Merlot really helps kind of soften it out and smooth it out. And Cabernet tannins are really big and they're kind of spiky and they have like big gaps in them. And so the Merlot is kind of this fine grain tannin and it kind of sits in between and kind of plushes out the palate. And so you don't notice all of this big yeah. square tannin because you've filled in the gaps with the Merlot fine grain tannins and it completes the palate a little bit more. Um, another reason I used a little bit of Merlot was to help bring the cost of the wine down. So Merlot, where a Cabernet costs $7,800 a ton, Merlot only costs $4,000 a ton. So it's half the cost to buy Merlot grapes than it is to buy Cabernet grapes. So, you know, when you're making a product like Hollis, um, you've got it you, and you're taking that into account, you know, your cost per gallon, even though, you know, I would, I'd never make a wine and be like, oh, I have to bring the cost down and, and throw a whole lot of junk in it to make right. it cheap, right? But, um, and so like, I blend and I go, okay, look, this is looking too tannic and also, you know, we're, we're not going to make much margin on this wine. Like, let's try some Merlot or um, some Malbec that I have. And let's put it in and see, is this going to work? And if it's going to work, great. Then we roll with that and we start doing blending trials. If it's not going to work, it wouldn't, it wouldn't go in. Like, yeah. that comes back to, like, we're having integrity as a winemaker, you, you know. Um, where, yeah. the, like, where the big guys go, too bad, you got to put the Merlot in because we need our costs another $10 lower case, lower a case yeah. versus... We're, we're a small family business. We don't really have to do that. You know, it's, it's always for Stuart quality first. Well, and I think the other thing to consider is that, I mean, Merlot and Cab, not just textually are, are friends. I mean, what we're talking about, they are directly related yeah. uh, in great, great parentage. Right. So these, you know, this is a classic, as we would call like a Bordelais style blend. We see this one, uh, blend all over the world. Uh, and oftentimes in the Napa Valley, I mean, this is not, at, at all unheard of. Um, right. in France, I mean, you can talk to this, Will. This is your, your corner. I mean, in France, most of these amazing ones are actually Merlot. They're not cab-based, right? I mean, if you want to spend some money on Petrus, baby, uh, you're drinking 100% Merlot, and it's the most yeah. expensive wine on earth. So, you know, they have fun really with that. Together. Merlot and cab. Yeah, yeah. And, and Sideways may have tried to convince the world that Merlot was trash, uh, but that is just not the case. All right. Um, Another that, question. And that's the only reason Merlot is half the price in Napa Valley than Cabernet, is that movie. 
You know, another interesting thing is they did a study and they found that even more so than it negatively affect worldwide sales of Merlot, it positively affected sales of Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir was seen as really hard to sell domestically because it was too light for a yeah. lot of people. And so that movie comes out and Pinot Noir sales just skyrocketed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's jump into the glass that you have in front of us. Uh, I think everybody really loved seeing you do your own personal tasting notes of the uh, Chateau Guthrie GSM on Tuesday. So generally when we're talking about Cabernet, we're talking about darker fruits. Uh, we're talking about the introduction of a, a more of an influence of those oak markers. So vanilla, cinnamon, and uh, tobacco, cigar box, stuff like that. Uh, but in particular on this wine, uh, take us through what you really think jumps out. Yeah, on the nose, the first thing I get, is kind of like this fresh cut redwood or fresh cut cedar like i get this beautiful kind of like cut wood character on the nose and then kind of rolling into like a leather like that those leather notes fresh fresh leather and then a hint of tobacco and it's kind of like it's more of like it's not like a cigar it's it's like a cigarette like not lit cigarette right like the fresh leaf like there's and the, and what i always i always get a distinct little hit of menthol with yeah. this wine like this uh, my dad's on this chat so he won't love this but like this tastes like the first cigarettes that i bought like <laughs> menthol cigarettes like there's a little bit of that menthol kick and menthol is really that speaks to a, a, a compound that's in cabernet yes uh, pyrazines uh, and pyrazines are found in cab merlot cabernet franc sauvignon blanc all these wines are related uh and in napa oftentimes that can ripen out uh, and so that green note is actually seen as a, a really down, like a negative thing in Napa Valley Cab generally. Uh, and what, what happens when that gets really, really ripe is it turns into like coffee and, and mocha and espresso. Yeah. Yeah. But on this, I, I get that tinge of mint for sure. But when, when I'm picking, that's like, that's a, that's a big thing I'm looking for with the ripeness of fruit when I'm picking. And so that pyrazine is in there and, and, and the sink of pyrazine in the grape is, is loaded at the st when it's young and green. And as it ripens and it's exposed to the sun and as it, the sugars ripen, that sink of pyrazine starts to deplete. And so when it's front loaded, it's really like fresh cut bell pepper, you know, like jalapeno really cut. And as the grapes ripen, a lot of that kind of disappears and you start getting more into the dried herb characters and then a little bit and, and mint characters. And so for me, I actually like just a little hint of it on the back of the palate, like just that dried herb. I don't want like the fresh cut green character. I like that dried herb character. Uh, and so it's getting to that point because I also think once you get past that point where you don't see any of it, then you start getting all these overripe flavors. And that's when you get the raisin and the sweet sugary flavors, which I just find really, they're not complex flavors for me. And so I don't like to go that far. So it's a constant battle with me where I'm trying to get my fruit as ripe as I can without it getting into that raisin because I just want that, just that hint of dried herb um, on, the, on, the, on the nose and the palate. But yeah, it's, I mean, a lot of leather menthol cigarette i wasn't a, <laughs> wasn't a smoker will i'm sorry no i'm good good uh and thankfully dad, not, my dad was either. a two pack a day man so i, I, I <laughs> get well and now that you're taking the wine to the palate i'm really curious because somebody asked about this in the chat um you talked about the tannins on this wine being pretty pronounced and that's one of the reasons why you were really looking at merlot to kind of soften that up or meld them to be a little bit more fine-tuned uh yeah. don branch is asking do you think that that is affecting the ageability of this wine no like, when, like to you to you will this wine still have some longevity to it totally because there's more to wine aging than just tannin there's um, alcohol tannin um and uh microbial stability and acid so there's a, there's a very variance that come into aging but what i even though we soften the tannins out there's no less tannin in the wine, right? Because if we had used a fining product to remove it from the wine, then there would be less. So, so I don't actually believe, I believe the key to making big cabs, beautiful cabs, is actually having, loading it up with tannin, just having the right structure tannin. 
And so when I had my tannin, we, sometimes you can add tannin on top of tannin and it becomes soft and, it, and, and, you, and you see it less. And it's not that there's less there, it's that you've, you've taken something that was a spiky kind of um, substrate on your palate and you've filled the gaps in to make it smooth. And so instead of seeing all of this tannin on your palate, it's, so it's turned into a more smooth surface. And so there's still, there's probably, there's not, there's no less tannin in it. It's, it's just, it's, it's built better. Um, this wine will age beautifully. This, this 10 years, this will be great. Yeah. I think this is an eight to 12 year old, uh, eight to 12 wine. You're on mute, mate. I, I do that so that, again, people only hear the motorcycles going by. Um, the other thing about tannin is that, you know, you get, there are different types, as you were mentioning, there's different types of tannin, but also for those that are drinking this wine at home right now, like think about where each wine that you drink hits you with tannin, right? You, you'll have some that it, it feels like it's right on the front of your two front teeth. Some it'll be more gummy. Some it'll be more on the side of your cheeks. Some it'll be your tongue. So, yeah. You know, different different kinds of tannin hit you in different places. Whether it's oak tannin, grape tannin, stem tannin. Yep. Uh, when you're when you're drinking cheap wines, uh, synthetic tannin. You uh, know, there's there's all this. Uh, all a this lot stuff. of the tannin we have. So in 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 the in the wines that we're making, more natural wines. Really, we're we're getting our tannins from our grape skin, our grape seed, and our barrel. Um, and so usually, when you have a wine that's really dry and it sucks the moisture out of your mouth quite often that's seed tannin and it's underripe seed tannin. And that's a lot, big reason why Napa Valley cabs are so voluptuous and plush because the winemakers are trying to get that seed tannin to really ripen. And so our seeds inside the berry, when we pick them are nice and brown and they're not green. When they're green, you get this really raw seed tannin. Um, there's a lot of that sucking character, but let's talk about the palate. It's really fresh still. I mean, it's really vibrant. It's funny because it's, even though it's a really dark wine, I get a lot of like, like kind of boysenberry and raspberry on the palate as well. It's not just these kind of black currants and blueberry and, and cassis and things. It's got this like nice kind of framework of like light red fruit. Um, they might be coming from the Merlot, you know, it's probably, it's probably where that's coming from. That's more of a Merlot character. Um, it still has some really nice texture though, you know, like when I talked about the cab and the Merlot tannins, it's not too soft. And, you know, I think I talked about this in one of the previous tastings where I like it to have texture. If it's too soft and plush, it just goes down too quickly and you forget about it too quickly. Texture is really important in wine. Definitely. Talk about the finish. I mean, I feel like all of I feel like all of your wines have really good length on the finish. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons is your dedication to maintaining balanced acidity because yeah. acidity is really what carries a wine. To the exactly. finish. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all to do with the acidity. So it's to do with the tartaric acid in wine. There's, there's three main acids in wine. There's tartaric acid, malic acid, and citric acid. Tartaric acid's really what gives wine length. Um, and so making sure that you're not losing all of your acidity in the, in the vineyard um, because you can't replace natural acidity. You know, we, we can add tartaric acid in the winery and you can buy a bag of tartaric acid, which has been extracted from wine. And, and it's just sent back as a powder form of tartaric, concentrated tartaric acid, but it's never the same as the natural acidity. Like natural acidity just has yeah. this like juicy, like, beautiful i don't know what i don't know how to ex describe it it's like it's, your mouth knows that it's the real thing like the real thing yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. It, it's i mean i can't the general public probably would never notice the difference because they don't get to see one or the other but for me as a winemaker like in the winery like i know what that barrel tastes like with its natural acidity in from the winery and then if i put some acid into it i know what it tastes like and it always yeah. is disjointed and so it's it's yeah, it's finding that balance of ripeness, but keeping as much natural acidity as possible. Um, yeah. Reality is, as we're in California, and generally we do, hit, especially in big cabs like this, we do have to make um, tartaric acid additions. Yeah, it's kind of the reality of where we are. We can't turn our sunlight off. Uh, Christine Tinker asked, 
or I guess said and then asked, uh, and this actually goes back to your history in wine. Uh, we think Hollis is similar to the Paul Hobbs Cross Barn Cab. Are there similar similarities in the process processes between the two? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's very similar in the mindset of where he has the Paul Hobbs brand and then he has a second tier brand, which is Cross Barn, which is a more affordable brand. Um, when I worked for Paul, we would quite often bring barrels over from Paul Hobbs over to Cross Barn that he that weren't making the cut. And quite often we would also send barrels back the other way over to Hobbs that we had made a cross barn that, that were, were amazing. Um, so very similar. I mean, with Cabernet, Paul really taught me how to make cab. So if you get resemblance to Paul Hobbs or cross barn cabs, that's just because he, he taught me how to make Napa cab, really. Um, I didn't know a thing about cab before I moved and worked for him. I was cool climate making Riesling and, and Chardonnay and things. And, so I, I, I learn everything off a of pole when it comes to Cabernet. That's amazing. Um, somebody was asking, we've been talking about the chemistry a little bit. Uh, Paul Scranton asked, can you help us understand malolactic fermentation and do you use this in your process? For those, for those who don't know, um, malolactic fermentation is really one of the most uh, prominent winemaking techniques that everybody in the world can usually describe, but they don't know what it actually is. Uh, anytime that you're saying a wine, oh, like for instance, Chardonnay, uh, tastes like butter, you are usually talking about malolactic fermentation. It's the conversion of these citric acids to uh, lactic acids. So think about, you know, squirting a lemon in your mouth versus pouring a, a cup of cream into your mouth. I mean, it's just a, a different palate expression. But talk about as a winemaker, how you manage malolactic fermentation and the role it plays in red wines. Yeah, so we put all of our red wines through malolactic fermentation. Um, there's two reasons. Um, the first is what you just talked about, Will. Malic acid is a really sharp acid. Think of a, um, a fresh cut green apple. Green apple has huge amounts of malic acid in it. And so it's quite sharp and, 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 and raw. And so um, the bacteria consume the malic acid and, turn, and, and, and it turns into uh, lactic acid. Lactic acid is a soft acid. You think of lactic acid, think of milk, and cream, you know, it, it's soft. Um, so there's two reasons we do it. One is for microbial stability. If you don't put it through malolactic acid, while it's age, um, malolactic fermentation, while it's aging in barrel, you can it's a food source for other bacteria to consume. And then your wine can turn into vinegar. Um, the other reason is because we're trying to soften the wines out. So red wine, when it's young, is really raw, especially Bordeaux, like Cabernet and Merlot and things is really raw and really hard and, and, and drying and just not very enjoyable. So putting it through malolactic fermentation really helps put the soft acid in there and kind of plush out the palate and make it a lot more enjoyable to drink. Um, and so, and there's different ways we do it and there's, you can, it naturally happens in the winery. Um, you can also add your own um, malolactic um, culture. So, um, you can buy a cultured bacteria from a yeast uh, winery provider and add it in and certain strains will do certain things. So Ron Barra Chardonnay, they use a particular strain that creates a huge amount of diacetyl. Diacetyl is a byproduct of the, of the malolactic fermentation and diacetyl is butter. That's what it tastes like butter. Um, so certain strains will create huge amounts of diacetyl, certain strains will create hardly any. Um, I, I just put ours through natural fermentation. I don't add any bacteria. I just let whatever go, whatever go. Um, uh, another thing you can do, if I'm tasting the wine at the end of malolactic fermentation and it's too creamy and too buttery, um, and what you can do is leave the wine and let it sit and let that bacteria, when that bacteria runs out of malic acid to eat, it'll start actually reconsuming the diacetyl. And so you can actually get the bacteria to reconsume that diacetyl and cut some of that creaminess down. Um, so quite often if I have a wine that's really creamy and I'm like, well, it, for me, it looks uncomplex. It looks like sugar. Um, I'll, I'll let the, the bacteria continue to consume that diacetyl a little bit. Um, but you, uh, if you think of wines like Savion Blanc, they, have, they generally do not go through malolactic fermentation. And that's a big reason why they're so fresh and crunchy. Yeah, just ripping us through the video. Um, We've got a, a handful of questions regarding uh, kind of cab in general and Napa in general. So uh, I want to take just a moment to, to look these over. 
Uh, the first question is, ba -ba -ba -bum, what's the topography of the areas where these grapes are sourced from in Napa? And Napa is, I mean, really, when we're talking about Napa, it's a north-south running valley. You've got the Mayacamas on the west side. You've got the Baca Mountains on the east side. Uh, and, you know, what, like 18, 16 or 18 sub-AVAs within Napa. But really, the, the two, like, hallmark I guess uh, categories are like valley fruit and mountain fruit as far as like topography relates to it. Uh, yeah. But for the Hollis, where, where a lot of these grapes come yeah. from. So we're mainly valley floor. So yeah. a lot of what I do for, for Stuart, I don't really, I'm currently not sourcing anything from the mountains. Um, and that's right. a stylistic thing for us. We Valley floor creates really much more plush wines. And for Stuart sellers, we're kind of looking to add that plushness because I am a big fan of acidity in wine and, and it helps balance that acidity. So you have the plush, soft tannins from Valley Floor with my acidity. If I was doing a lot more mountain fruit, it wouldn't match my acidity as well because those, those wines are, are typically pretty raw and crunchy up in the mountains. And so I feel like if you had the same amount of acid, it would just accentuate that too much for what we're trying to do. Not that that wouldn't be beautiful and someone could make a great wine that way, but for what we're trying to do with the Stuart Sellers, it's not what I want. I want them to be nice and plush and, and voluptuous. Um, yeah, but mountain uh, tannins, mountain tannins. Yeah, mountain big, tannins, yeah. about that, right? They're big, chewy tannins, yeah. And I mean, you know from so, probably doing your psalm exams, you can really see that difference in mountain tannin versus valley floor tannin. It's a good way, you know, when you're tasting a wine, trying to decide is it, from a mountain range or not, right? Yeah. 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 Cause yeah, we don't need to get too far down the rabbit hole, but uh, you know, tasting wine from like Pritchard Hill, Howell Mountain versus Rutherford, right. Oakville, Santa Elena, Oak Knoll, Yountville, wherever yeah. it is. Like I mean, Napa is a different. awesome place. The, even just the valley floor of Napa is amazing because Napa is a massive patchwork of soils. So it's, it's all, it's volcanic and glacial and old river runs. And so you have like, these amazing like alluvial fans coming off of yep. old rivers. You've got areas that are, are, vol are decomposed volcanic rock that are completely just ironized, um, oxidized iron that are really red. Like it's an amazing area to really to grow grapes. Yeah, yeah, super, super diverse and fun in that way. Um, which leads me right into the question from Kate and Michael Cooney. Why is Cabernet Sauvignon so expensive? Is it just land price? Is it something about the way the grape grows? Um, and I think there's a, there are a number of different points in California, but more specifically Napa. It's not just the price of the land yeah. because California land is really, really expensive. Uh, but there are a lot of factors that go into it. Yeah. There's, there's multiple factors. I would say like, you know, globally, it's got, it's the most prestigious grape. If you think globally, um, you know, maybe Merlot would be next to it and Pinot, but like, it's a pretty prestigious grape. It's it, people love drinking it. Um, in the U S you know, it's really held to a higher caliber than a lot of other grapes. Um, the, uh, I think the biggest factor is supply and demand. So Napa Valley is actually very small. It's tiny. I think it's a quarter of the size of Bordeaux. Is that what, right? Will? I mean, it's the, the actual Napa Valley is even less than that. Less than yeah, because so Bordeaux is pretty big. Yeah, so you think about, you know, like how small we are and how much demand there is for, for the grape. So that's really pushed prices up. Um, and it's a beautiful place. It's only an hour and a little bit an hour over an hour out of San Francisco. So it's become like a huge tourist hub. Um, and then that's caused land prices. Both of those factors have caused land prices to go up. And so whenever anyone buys land or a vineyard, they suddenly have this giant mortgage on it. And so they, if they're smart, they'll try and make the vineyard that they're planning pay for that mortgage, which then increases the great price. Um, also, um, Napa Cabernet, Cabernet generally also is a pretty low yielding crop. So Cab doesn't, you can't hang a lot of fruit on the vines. They naturally like to have lower yielding fruit on them versus something like Zinfandel or Grenache where they grow, you can hang huge amounts of crop on it. So, you know, no matter what you're doing, it costs you per acre to farm your grapes. And so if you have two tons on those vines per acre or six tons per acre, I mean, you can do the math. You're splitting that farming cost between two or six tons. 
Um, yeah. But that's also a bit, big part of the reason it, it drives the price up. Because we have Savion Blanc in Napa Valley, that's, you know, we only pay 2,500 a ton for it. Um, but yeah. we can hang seven tons an acre on, on, on Savion Blanc. Yeah, I think the, I mean, the difference between the most prestigious spot in Sonoma for cab, generally speaking, is probably, you know, you're talking about Moon Mountain, you're talking about Alexander Valley, and you're talking about Knights Valley, and, you know, I guess like Chalk Hill. But okay. those price wise per ton don't go even close no. to what you see from Napa. And for those who maybe missed it earlier, uh, the average price per ton of cab in Napa is about 7800 bucks a ton, which roughly translates to between 70 and $80 retail for a bottle. Like That's a really rough breakdown of what you need to sell that bottle for to make, to make any money. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think it's a pretty big misconception because it's so expensive to be in the wine industry that um, everybody's just rolling in it and, and making huge amounts of money. But you know, we're, uh, the re I think the reality for most small brands is that, that you know, these the expensive grapes are actually hurt us and make, make it difficult and make us, we make less money quite often because we're trying, because the reality is, is that most people can't afford an $80 bottle of wine, you know, so it's difficult, but you still want to make Napa Cab, you know, um, so that's why, Hollis, that's why Hollis is doing so well, you know, it's, it's priced really well. And I mean, even at like $40, you know, depending on where it is, like 38 to $45 a bottle, like that's still pretty expensive for a bottle of wine. Um, but for us doing it out of Napa, it's actually dirt cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, as a, as a young wine enthusiast going uh, tasting in Napa was like just a really quick way to make sure that I sweated it out the next month for paying rent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, come on, man. It, yeah. That's a big reason a lot of these, you know, like my Guthrie family wines brand is why I'm going out into these kind of less, um, you know, off the beaten path really and going into the Sierra Fitholes and up into Mendocino to get grapes because those are the only grapes that, you know, I can afford for that brand. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jim Washburn asked, how would you both recommend tasting a wine on the palate? So what, what people have seen you do is, you know, take a sip, swirl it around, uh, introduce some oxygen to it. Uh, I I like to, especially when I'm tasting for work, I always spit. Uh, I taste the wine better when I spit because I get less of the influence of alcohol as yeah. I'm swallowing it. Yeah. Plus, I can, you know, taste 30, 40 wines in a row that way. 30, 40 wines in a row while you're swallowing is pretty difficult. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, sometimes I'll have to taste... I'll taste over 150 barrels in a day. And I mean, if yeah. I was spitting, I'd be on the floor. Um, and even well, after, barrel samples yeah. are, can be intense. But even after that, I mean, even spitting for three hours and tasting, I'm usually buzzed and I'll have to go eat lunch and, and drink some water before I get back to work. Um, but generally what I do, so I think the best way, I, I agree, Will, like when you're really trying to pull a wine to pieces, that spitting actually helps me do it. Um, maybe it's the in and out you hit your pellet twice or something I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I do is I draw it back across my pellet and the reason I'm drawing it with and with ear so I'm sucking it through is that I'm trying to oxidize the wine across my pellet so oxygen is, is creating a chemical reaction um, in the wine similar to like decanting it um, and then swirling it around your pellet as well um, it's helping the, the, the saliva, so the proteins in your saliva are also reacting with the wine as well and kind of ha chemical reactions are happening to help you um, basically release fruit and flavor and things like that. Um, like the saliva in your, in, your, in your palate is reacting with the tannins and it's actually fining out the tannin and like kind of softening it and dropping it out a little bit and letting you see more into the wine. Um, but basically, I'm pretty loud when I do it. Usually, like at the winery, I make a lot of noise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I always have I have my little spit cup, you know. And and here at home, I don't have like a designated spit cup, so I was using a uh, like a silicone to go glass. Um, don't just leave those around the house because sometimes <laughs> they can be confused with actual wine pours. Oh uh, yeah, I've done that. <laughs> 
<laughs> so definitely that's one uh, wine tasting piece of advice. There was a great question earlier from Michael Mayers that I missed. Um, sorry, Michael. Uh, I did not feel the tannins in the wine were very pronounced compared to other cabs. So they were saying that they definitely noticed the Merlot. Uh, and they're wondering like, what kind of effect will aging have on the finish, but also the tannins that even in this wine that you've kind of softened up a little bit in the winemaking process? Yeah. So I still see the tannin a lot. Like it's, it's not aggressive, but I see it's pretty bumpy right now. So I think what usually happens with tannin, it becomes finer grained as it ages. Um, that's mainly because it's forming longer tannin chains on the palate. So when you, when you feel tannin, you're usually feeling it because it's lots of tiny little chains of tannin and they're, and they're kind of spiky. That's why you're wow. feeling it more on the palate. As it ages, those chains bind and they become longer and longer and longer. And that's, where, that's why it feels finer grained and softer. Um, I think the acid, the acid will also integrate more. Like right now at the back of the palate, you see the acid still, like you can see it and it's not distracting. Uh, and it might just be me because I'm the winemaker and I can really kind of zone in. I know what happened to it, but I, at the very back of the palate, I kind of get the flavor of tartaric almost like the flavor of what a tartaric acid is. Then it will become more integrated. So usually as wines age, they just become a lot more integrated. Um, right. The oak's pretty well integrated already. So I don't know how much more that will change. You probably, you notice the oak less as it ages as well. Everything just becomes more harmonious. It's, you know, when a wine's young, everything's stacked on each other or in between each other. And so you're just letting that all like mold in as it ages really. Yeah. I always, I always compare it to people trying to get in the door at prom, right? So when a wine's young, everybody's just waiting at the door and going single file and kind of everything is just one piece after another. And it's not that it's disjointed. It's just that everything is very individual. And then, you know, a couple hours later, every, somebody spiked the punch and everybody's in the party together. Everybody's one cohesive mob in the middle of the dance floor. Uh, at least this was my prom experience. I don't right. know about yeah. other people's prom experience. Um, well, thank you, Michael. I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> Wait, really? That's too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, problem's awful, so don't worry about it. Um, okay, let's uh, let's go back to some of the questions. Um, we have a couple and uh, one in the chat chat column too. Just so yeah, he also submitted in the Q and A. So Clay, I swear to God, I will get to that. Um, speaking of winemaking at Stuart Sellers, uh, does the family ever try to give you unsolicited winemaking advice from G Go Timer? Of course. Yeah. How yeah. do you respond to that? Smile and wave, right? Smile and wave. Yeah, I mean, my father-in-law is just terrible at it. I mean, my, my father-in-law, it's, it's, um, it's funny because we were giving Camus crap before, but um, he's a 78-year-old um, white man from Texas, right? He's your stereotypical Napa Valley cab drinker. And he, um, he, he loves to come in and say, Blair, you need to be doing this. You need, you know, I had some Camus last night and that, it was a beautiful bottle. And, you know, you, we, we got to make the wine like this. And I'm just, I'm like, great. I, I'll do that for you. <laughs> right. Oh my God. Um, but when, when it comes to Caroline and James, they, they, I think they, they know now that, um, that I'm pretty confident in what I'm doing. And they understand that I have a, a vision and that I'm very dedicated to making it work. And so they, 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 they've learned to kind of just back off and let me do what I want. Which is good. That's nice. I love yeah. that. Um, what, what goes into determining when you actually release a wine, uh, is because you probably, I mean, there's a lot in terms of like the barrel aging process, maybe a wine needs more time in barrel, but like once it's reached its zenith in barrel and you're ready to bottle, uh, are you giving the wines extended bottle age or is it kind of like, let's get to market and get this baby? Yeah, so generally we, we've always tried to hold them in bottle for a year after they go, go out of barrel and into bottle. We've tried to sell them for one year before we release them to the public. Um, that's been the general rule. Um, just in the last kind of 18 months though, we've really, Stuart Sellers has really taken off and we, we've been caught off a little bit when we've had to release a little earlier. I mean, we'll, they'll still be in barrel, bottle for six months before we release them. Um, but we're, we're now on catch up. So now, I'm, like I said, I'm going to make 2000 cases of Hollis so that we're going to be able to keep it in the cellar for 12 months and not have to release it early. 
because my wines I've noticed that they definitely look a hundred percent better after one year in bottle. They definitely like I like with my Guthrie wines. I like things to go to bottle a little bit hard and, and a little bit square and soften out in the bottle. That usually I I'm finding when I open them, I drink them after a year that that's that kind of sweet spot. Um, so I mean, there's you know in the perfect world I would have them in in the bottle for Cabernet a year, a year and a half before people drink them. But there's economics involved as well, right? We if we do that, we wouldn't we won't get our money out of that for four years. You know, it's we pick the grapes. They're, they we I have them in the winery for two years, aging in barrels and working on them in barrel, and then they go to bottle. For, um, and then they sit in the cellar for a year. So we're at three years and then it usually takes us another year to sell it, right? That's four years that we've just put in X amount of dollars into that we're just getting out at the end of four years. So it's, there's economics involved, right? It's very capital intensive. As, yeah. you know, now we're at the point where we've kind of got the cycle going, right? So the older wines are feed, funding the newer wines, um, but it's still very, um, that's kind of a big part of the reason why making is really difficult financially. Yeah. Uh, Ted and Kelly were asking when buying, drinking, when you're buying or drinking cabs and more specifically Napa cabs, uh, do you find any value in knowing what other grapes are included? I'll briefly chime in. The only reason why I think that there could be is that it might open your eyes a little bit to the fact that like specifically Merlot uh, has a lot to give to a wine. It has a lot to give to a Napa Valley wine specifically. Um, I don't find Petit Verdot very uh, intriguing personally. It's not, it's not a grape that I like seeking out varietal wines of, but I know other people who they've seen it included in a Bordelais style wine and, and a cab from Napa and have sought it out and they really enjoy it. So that's where I might find some value in that and just be exposed to more varieties and, and seeking them out as varietal bottlings. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the only reason you really need to know what's in there is if you're trying to learn more about wine. You know, if you're just yeah. drinking it um, to enjoy it, you do, it doesn't really matter. Um, but I mean, if you're really wanting to dive more into wine and become more educated, it can be pretty helpful to figure out what you like. You know, why do I like X versus Y? Oh, it's because this one has Malbec in it or this one has Petit Verdot in it or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, since we're on the subject of this wine and we've got technically five minutes left, but we'll We'll just make sure that we get to all the questions. Uh, John asked, how long ba, 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 How long should you expect a Cabernet to last after it's been bottled? Does that differ based on room and wine fridge temperature? And really quick, yes, absolutely. Nothing determines a wine's ageability other than the actual juice in the bottle more than storage conditions. You want to keep your wines in cool, dark places as they age ideally with some humidity but placing the bottles on their side will really help with that so that the wine stays in contact with the cork and the cork doesn't shrivel up, allowing in oxygen. But uh, you okay. have obviously... Never store a wine nick up if it has a cork in it because the cork dries out. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, you and I sat down with your uh, Nomad collection last summer and we tasted back to what, 2006? Yeah. 2004. Something like right that. Right around there. And again, like, Cab is one of those grapes that should age as well as anything out there because, you know, when it's made well, it has acidity, uh, it has the tannin structure, uh, has even some alcohol that should keep it. Uh, and typically it also sees time in barrel, which will really help. With that. Yeah. yeah, I think, um, you know, what I do is if, if you like, like buy a wine, taste it and drink it. If you like it and you think that that'll age well, if it has really good tannin structure and has nice acidity, and it doesn't have any sugar in it, if it doesn't taste sweet, then go buy a six pack or a 12 pack and right. sell, it, sell it. Don't just blindly buy a wine and sell it um, because it's buyer beware. There, you know, where Cabernet generally does age very well and all the wines I make for Stuart and Hollis um, will age 10 years all day long. Um, but that does not mean everything. A bottle of Camus lasts about 18 months. You know, a, a 2017 Camus would be, you drink that now. If you put that in your cellar for 10 years, it's going to be horrible. Yeah. Not all uh, wine ages as well. <laughs> Not all wine ages. Yeah. Uh, since you just mentioned Camus, somebody asked, we opened the wine and let it sit for two hours before tasting, and they really enjoyed that. 
Uh, what would you compare your cabin style to uh, elsewhere in Napa? Yeah, I mean, I would compare it to Paul Hobbs wines, you know, because he, he's what taught me. Um, another guy, I kind of feel like we're in a similar ballpark is um, Alfa Omega um, winery. They, they do a couple of similar vineyards as me and, you know, we're kind of in the same category for winemaking. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Just a couple more about directly to this. And then I know there are some general ones for you. Um, what more could you expect from a hundred dollar Napa cab or a $250 Napa cab? Uh, given that the steward sellers, uh, cab is around 70 bucks. So kind of in that tier. And then the nomad is about 250. I mean, I generally just think of, um, density. Like, especially yeah. when you're talking about Napa. It's hard to explain. I think that if I was not a big wine drinker, and, I, and you know, I wouldn't waste my money on a $200 bottle. You know, like, you, you need to be able to know a little bit about wine. And, and you don't necessarily need to know about wine making, but you need to have tasted a lot of wine and really understand what you're tasting, why you like it, and why it's better. Um, if, if you just want a really good bottle of wine and you're not a massive wine drinker and you're not super educated in it yet, I mean, I would say max out at like $100 a bottle. Yeah. You know, you wanted something really special for a great evening with friends. And then once you've, you've been drinking it and you've really got into it and you've dived into it and you've done a lot more tasting, maybe you belong to a tasting group, or maybe you've drank a shitload of wine store wines that have been turning up to your door every month, like then start diving into some of those high dollar stuff. But I think the reality is, is that you got to kind of, I don't know how to explain that. Well, like you've got to kind of understand, you know what it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because ultimately like if you go into a $250 bottle of wine, just thinking it will be objectively more delicious, you're probably going to be disappointed. Yeah. Because it's not just about deliciousness yeah, and it's nuance. about, right. It's about hopefully nuance. And, you know, in Napa, when you're talking about $250, you're really talking about a select few number of vineyards that, have old vines planted which leads to density and complexity and concentration and, and stuff like that so i would say that hands down the biggest jump in quality that you get in the world of wine is ten dollars to twenty dollars you know because like at ten dollars it's really hard to find like a state wine uh and it's and it's really hard to find wines that uh are made in any sort of artisanal way with care uh just because of the economics of it yeah but at twenty dollars you start to get into that realm and the quality just takes such a huge jump that even 75 bucks to 750 bucks, like I've, I've had bottles of wine that cost a thousand dollars and you know, they were delicious. The ratio yes. doesn't go the same. Right. Or... Exactly. There's a point of diminishing returns for sure. Uh, and that goes into a, a question. That, somebody... yeah. that what you're saying is really right. Like I feel like that there's this price tier where like $20 to like $35 is like this price tier where you see that quality. Then it's like 35 to like 50, you see like, you can yeah. see that difference in that tier versus that tier. And then 50 to 100, there's like that tier. Then there's like 100 to 200 is like that tier. And then the rest is kind of, you know, up to the, yeah. the purveyor. Yeah, I mean, there might be like the great wines in the world, but you know, again, like those are so inaccessible that right. I got it. Anyways, um, so let's let's get to some of the. We've got nine questions in the queue, so let's uh, let's knock them out. Um, what types of wines do you enjoy as everyday drinkers? Syrah. I, I'm a glue glue guy. I mean, that's why I started Got Three Family Wines. It's, I make I make what I wanted to drink. I love my pizza wine. Yeah, yeah, pizza wine is great. But I I love Pinot Noir in most fashions, but um, yeah, I mean we drink a decent amount of Syrah at our house as well. Um, what, uh, do you have a suggestion on a book that you would give to people that are first getting into wine? I know the other night I recommended the world Atlas of wine. I like maps and pictures. So that really worked for me. I'm big on podcasts. I love listening to these mm. wine podcasts. I think they're great to learn because it's kind of com a lot of conversations like this. Um, yeah. and, and you learn things that you just don't get in the books. For sure. Uh, for someone who really likes your wines, um, Hollis and Guthrie Family Wines, what other small winemakers would you recommend for them to check out? Yeah, um, I mean, 
to be honest, the entire portfolio of Weinster, <laughs> and I would just order the Weinster wines and, and I'm not trying to just plug it, plug it. I mean, they're, they're a great array and, you know, like they've been very well selected. I, I, I drink a lot of the wines because I, that Weinster carries, not because they carry them, but like those are the wines that I drink and friend yeah. winemakers and stuff. So I would say, you know, I don't know every wine that was on the wine monster platform, but a lot of them I drink. Yeah. Ditto. Um, somebody was asking if they could see your personal house wine collection. I guess the other question is like, do you collect wine at all? I don't generally collect wine. I have a pretty, especially since shelter in place, I've been trying to support all my okay. friends and I have a pretty massive collection right now. Um, but I really enjoy uh, fresh, bright wines. I'm, I'm not, I don't like the profile of really old wine. And so I just don't collect it. And I'm not, I don't have enough money to buy collectible wines either. Yeah, I'm, we're about maxed out. We've got about 15 cases of wine here at the house right now. And another <clears throat> 25, I've got a storage unit in Napa for my wine because living in New York, like we're, wine was just filling up our living room. Um, <clears throat> let's see, somebody asked, why do some red wines give you a hangover, hangover and others don't? Somebody drank the entire bottle on Tuesday of the Chateau Guthrie GSM, well done, uh, and had no ill effects. And there are so many reasons to go into this, and I want to qualify this, that we are not doctors. We are not giving you medical advice, so don't sue us. However, Blair? Yeah, I, I'm actually doing a, a Zoom on Saturday with a health and beauty expert about this whole stuff um, scenario um, you probably if you get a hangover from a red wine a lot of the time it's actually a histamine reaction um, it is not sulfur um, it's proven that it's not sulfur a lot of people say sulfur is um, is what gives you the headache it's complete bs um, usually you get headaches from heavier red wines and you don't get them from light red wines um, and a lot of that is because of um, um, the the, the compounds that are in red wine and a lot of it is to do with the tannin. It creates a histamine reaction in your body. Um, you, you might re also realize sometimes notice when you're drinking big red wines that you get a stuffy nose yeah. and the same yeah. thing happening. And some, some people just have a bigger reaction to that than, than others. Um, there's like an amino acid that's consumed during fermentation and it creates um, can't remember the name of it. It creates another molecule, and, and our bodies can sometimes have a reaction to that that molecule. Yeah. Um, it generally happens in big red wines, though. That's why yeah. people get the red wine headache. So if you find that big red wines give you a headache, just and you still want to drink red wine, drink the lighter red wines like Pinot or Carignan that's made in like my uh, Galaxy style, um, or drink or drink white wine. I mean, yeah, either. When I'm blending the Stuart wines, I get a stuffy nose and it, yeah. it's a histamine reaction. I also always tell people like, make sure you're monitoring how much water you're drinking. Like nothing gets you more hungover than being dehydrated. And look, I love nothing more than drinking three bottles of wine to my head in a single night. Like that's what brings me joy in life. Totally, just a, a big part of the reason people get headaches is because they're drinking alcohol. Right, right. You, like people forget that it's toxic, right? Alcohol is toxic is why you get drunk. That's the price of poker. Um, let's see. Are there any non Sauvignon Blanc New Zealand vineyards that you would recommend? I mean, if people don't want Sauvignon Blanc, they could go to like Gambit Gravels. They could go to Central Otago. Yeah, I love the wines out of Central Otago. Really into those. Do um, you know what wine I actually really enjoy is um, Two Paddocks. And it's Sam Neill, who's the Hollywood actor. Um, from yeah. Park. He, he's a New Zealander. And um, he has two paddocks, and I actually really enjoy his pinots. I like uh, the Burn Cottage pinots. Uh, There's yeah. another one that's a little bit more mass produced that comes out of New Zealand called um, the Meg, M E G, um, okay. the Otago Pinot. And it's like 18 or 20 dollars a bottle, and it's awesome. Yeah. Really good Pinot Noir, uh, even from like Martin Bro as well. Uh, yeah. those, are, those are really, really good. Um, have you had a. I'm going to finish with the last question that was submitted. That was too good. Uh, what was your most memorable moment as a winemaker? Uh, this is one time I was nude. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, most memorable is probably, I, you know, I, I got a, I, I broke my back at the winery. 
I got crushed under a piece of equipment and I broke my back in the middle of harvest. So that's probably the most memorable thing that happened to me. Yeah. Good Lord, man. Um, <laughs> what, uh, which beer do you typically drink with this cab? Modelo. Oh yeah, baby. Modelo too. I've been drinking a Negroni throughout our uh, tasting tonight. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. How did you make the decision to work with a company like Weinster from Paul Scrim? Just so uh, didn't it, think it was, it was through my friend Kieran Robinson Wines, who has um, his wines at, and Weinster as well. He makes Syrah. He, um, he put me on to, I think it was Bob. Yeah. yeah. And I messaged Bob and you know, I was, you're always looking for different channels to sell your wine. And he looked like he was doing something cool and interesting. And, and you know, my, my thought was always like, how do I get my wine in front of as many people as possible? Like, wine is a great way to do that because it's constantly sending my wine out across the country to people that may never, ever find my wine. Um, so I always thought that that was a great concept to get my wine in front of as many people as possible. Hmm. Um, let's see if I'm in Napa, what, where's the best place to have a drink with Blair? Is it the Stuart Cellars tasting room? Probably. I'm here every now and then. And there's a dive bar right next to the taster room. Yeah, baby. Lunches. Uh, and it was a really good lunch spot right there. Yep. And we got the cafe. Yep. Southside cafe. All right. Last question is the best question that has been asked. Uh, hands down. <laughs> what are the three best things about Australia? Uh. <laughs> For those who weren't with us uh, last week, this is uh, just making Blair answer for his crimes. Right. Three best things about us. There's, there's nothing really great. <laughs> I mean, the best thing has got to be how bad they are at rugby. And the second would be how bad they are at cricket. And then the third would be how bad their beer is. <laughs> oh my God, this makes me so, so happy. Somebody just typed in go Wallabies. Go Wallabies, come on. Oh go man. Well, I gotta say, uh, this was an hour and 10 minutes of, I love this. Uh, this was so awesome. So uh, Blair, thank you first and foremost uh, for <laughs> for sharing your wines with us, uh, for taking the time to answer all these incredible questions from people. Uh, everybody who's joining our tastings, thank you so much. This yeah. was a revelation for us. This was so, so much fun. A fun three episodes. It was fun. And I, I, I saw orders coming through for after our Zoom's finished. People put through orders. Like, that was awesome. Thanks for the support going through. Yeah. My, my dad texted me right after. He's just like, keep an eye out. I'm going in. I was like, that's right. I love it. Uh, all right, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, again, check your emails from this morning. There were details regarding the tasting that we'll do next month with Division Winemaking Company. Uh, all of Blair's wines are available right now on GuthrieFamilyWines.com. Is that the full? I yeah. always just type in Guthrie Family Wines and it pops up on my browser. Uh, you're sold out of my uh, Kieran Yon. Well, and we sold, we sold out of the pig pool. Uh, the pickle, sorry, the pickle. Yeah, yeah, we sold out of the pickle the other night. Yeah, and there's a little bit of Syrah, I need a little bit of Syrah left there too, I see. We're getting low, people, so make sure you put your orders in yeah. tonight, yeah. tonight. Uh, with that said, everybody, once again, thank you very much. Uh, Blair, you're the man, really appreciate it. Awesome, thanks guys. Talk soon. Adios.